Okay, it's noon, so I think I'll um, say hello to everybody and welcome you all to today's Core Connections lecture. Get this right. So if you're in line, feel free, make your sandwiches. There are a couple of seats here in the front row, and, um, and if we need more chairs, there are some around the perimeter here that we can, we can bring out. Uh, so uh, just a reminder, our series theme this semester is the art and politics of dissent. Um, last semester, we had uh, speakers um, offering uh, per perspectives from political science, and today we get to the art um, part of the pairing. So I'm very happy uh, to welcome Ryan Moore uh, today. He is Associate Professor of Sociology at Florida Atlantic um, University. His uh, teaching and research, his broad teaching and research interests, um, fo uh, largely in the area of, of, well, various aspects of social theory, um, but of particular interest for us, uh, or for our series, is his work on youth, uh, music, and counterculture. So he's the author of Cells Like Teen Spirit, Music, Youth Culture, and Social Crisis, and that came out um, in 2010 from New York University Press. And today he is um, going to talk about a, a, a new project that he's working on and ask us to invite us to consider the role that music has played and may or may not still play in social change. So please uh, join me in welcoming Ryan Moore. Uh, thank you, first of all, for having me here uh, to your lovely campus. And thank you for, thank you, Catherine, for the introduction. And uh, I'm just very happy to be here. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about, um, as Catherine said, like a new project that I have uh, in the works right now about music and cities, a sort of a urban sociology of music. And what I'll do today is kind of present uh, the theoretical framework for that work in a way that kind of emphasizes the continuities with my first book, Cells Like Teen Spirit. Um, and I, ha I have a lot of material for today. And I think what I'll do is kind of um, do like a, f an, a more of an overview or a run through and that way we'll have time for questions and that sort of thing. So um, I think like I'll d just show you because I have so much material that I, I couldn't possibly get through it in the f full hour that, um, you know, we'll just do something where uh, if there's something that strikes you as interesting, we can address it in the question and answer period. Um, so. Uh, the kind of the key terms that I use both in my first book and the new project are the terms rhythm and noise. And I look at these as, of course, like musical concepts, but also as sociological concepts as well. My goal or my idea has been to sort of theorize through music. That is to say, like not only um, develop a kind of a sociology of music, but also a kind of a musical sociology, like a, or a sonic sociology, I guess I prefer to think of it as. Um, one which looks at not just, you know, what happens, the institutions and organizations around music, but also to look at music as something that is inherently social, historical, and cultural. Um, and the sort of the key theoretical guiding light for my project, uh, especially for this um, one in process on cities and music, is this uh, French Marxist by the name of Henri Lefebvre, um, who has become a major theoretical uh, figure when it comes to the production of space and um, a particularly like urban sociology. Um, but he is also um, sought to reveal these relations between the urban experience and uh, everyday life in a concept that he calls rhythm analysis. And so th the rhythm analysis concept is one that sort of informs my own uh, use of the concept of rhythm as a sociological uh, term. These are sort of some of his key works and um, without you know, sort of going through each and every single one of them, um, the idea is to kind of note that around 1968, 
he starts to make a turn towards looking at urban uh, problems and the urban experience and uh, his books, The Right to the City and Urban Revolution and such. And there's a reason for that is because he was uh, very involved with and affected by the um, protests that occurred in Paris in, or uh, all over France in May of 1968. And with those protests began to theorize the city and the urban experience in sociological terms. Um, he's most well known for this book on the left called The Production of Space. And um, his project on rhythm analysis is one that he began uh, all the way back in the early 1960s, um, but it was uh, never really fully completed until posthumously um, after he died, his wife basically uh, put together a group of essays that he had written on this concept of rhythm analysis. And that's kind of the um, theoretical guiding light for my project. Um, the idea is like to kind of look at rhythm as a social or sociological force or something that binds people together as sort of a, uh, an element of social cohesion. And so I kind of put these pictures there to think about the different contexts in which we could think about like rhythm and drums and as something that in a wide variety of contexts promotes social solidarity and promotes, you know, sort of people um, forming, a, you know, a sort of a unified social group, whether that is a drum circle or a military march or a parade, uh, you know, the innumerable ways in which rhythm, drums, marching can be used or and have been used historically as a kind of a social glue. And um, the idea of music is that uh, rhythm in music performs the same kind of function. <clears throat> I feel I st feel like the, I'm not getting the microphone right. Is it all right? Okay. So, uh, what the uh, as far as Lefebvre's concept of rhythm analysis, um, it basically the idea is that uh, it, it it embodies a different kind of temporality as well as a, a different kind of flow of time, I guess would be the best way to put it, um, that is increasingly uh, in direct opposition to capitalist notions of time. Capitalist notions of time are very much like time is money to uh, sort of divide time into interchangeable, quantifiable, commodifiable segments, uh, whereas rhythm uh, for Lefebvre is something obviously that has a more of a cyclical kind of time that one that is for him more connected to the cycles of nature, birth, death, seasons, and so forth, and also um, to the physiology of the human body. And for Lefebvre, it's been rhythm um, and rhythmic time have been a kind of an enduring source of rites, rituals, and festivals. And music has, you know, sort of always been uh, a central role in those kinds of ceremonial events that, you know, bring together uh, members of a society. And, you know, we still very much see them today with, you know, all the festivals that um, occur during music festivals and such during the summer or spring. Um, but sort of Lefebvre's like problem or his, I guess I would say his key, what he's missing was I only really tried to ground rhythm in uh, nature without um, also looking at rhythm as something that is also a cultural or historical force, not something that is simply um, embodied in nature in the body, but also something that has like a social, cultural, historical roots. And uh, f I think the most important of those roots come from African culture. And Lef Lefebvre, being a French person, never really considered or thought or um, didn't seem to really know much or anything about African music or African society or African American music either. So my idea is to sort of um, bring in Lefebvre's rhythm analysis a kind of a cultural element as well as a natural one. 
And to do so, we sort of look at the role that uh, rhythm has played in African culture, again, as something that is a basis for participation and social solidarity, where music is fully integrated into everyday life, um, where music is a communal participatory activity in as opposed to something like in you know, in European traditions, music is like a special sort of thing to be performed by a designated musician. Uh, people sit and, you know, they maybe clap politely at the end. The idea of uh, music within African culture is very different. People participate by, you know, even at the level of just clapping their hands, stomping their feet, um, you know, uh, snapping along to the music. And so, and music is sort of inseparable from dancing and spiritual practice. So in all of these ways, like the role that rhythm plays in African culture is much more of a kind of social solidarity or a social glue. Now, much of that um, rhythm or rhythm-based culture was repressed uh, during, you know, the uh, centuries of slavery in uh, North America and in the Caribbean, um, especially drumming. Um, the, actually, in 1739, 1740, the states of uh, South Carolina and Georgia completely outlawed the use of drums uh, among slaves because uh, drumming had been used in uh, slave rebellions. You know, the drum people had used drums as a form of communication to communicate with one another uh, during these uprisings in the South. And so, in many places in the, uh, in the Americas, with some important exceptions, uh, the entire sort of rhythmic culture of African culture was repressed. Um, Congo Square in New Orleans represents one of the few but crucial exceptions to this um, because New Orleans was colonized by the French and the Spanish and they had, well, first the French and then the Spanish, uh, they had sort of more lax regulations about slavery. Um, slaves were allowed to congregate on Sundays in New Orleans in this place sort of behind the French Quarter where people could uh, trade um, and also uh, play drums and, you know, this was connected to like the persistence of like voodoo, religion and such in New Orleans. And so this is one of the reasons that New Orleans as a city has maintained, you know, a sort of, it's uh, such an intensely musical roots and especially like a connection to African culture. Um, it's often said that New Orleans is perhaps the, the, the most na uh, African city in all of North America. And so this is one place in which that kind of African music was able to survive in the States. Um, and in other you know, realms, uh, th that sensibility is able to persist and endure through work songs, field hollers, and probably the most uh, uh, frequent site of this persistence would be in the church. And where here you get the kind of the rhythm of the call and response form um, that is still very much an important part of African American music today, where, you know, the uh, preacher says a line, the chorus responds, the preacher says pretty much the same thing, chorus responds, the preacher then like says something slightly different, um, and chorus responds again. This has been incorporated into African American music from, you know, Ray Charles to Kanye West, does it especially well, I think, now. <laughs> so that's rhythm. And then our other element is noise. So if rhythm is something that creates social solidarity, noise is something that um, both as a sonic form and as a metaphor for society, noise is something that disturbs and interrupts communication, something that makes social order impossible. So noise is kind of the dialectical uh, f flip side of rhythm here. Uh, these experiments with noise have generally been undertaken by socially rebellious musicians, avant-garde art movements and such. Noise as a form of um, 
communication and also like a, a signal of a breakdown in communication. And because of this, so there is also just as there's been a long history of repressing rhythm by social authorities, there's also a long history of attempting to repress, you know, what is noise or what is seen or what is heard as noise in society. For this project, the main, or for, for the element of noise, the main theoretical guiding light is this uh, guy by the name of Jacques Attali, also French. Um, his idea is that noise is kind of ahead of its time and socially prophetic. And I always like these quotes from him where he says that, you know, noise makes audible the new world that will become visible. That it has some sort of sociological element of prophecy to it. And what I've tried to do is kind of take that principle and apply it to everything from jazz to indie rock and to sort of think about how noise or what's heard as noise is um, an indicator or a barometer of social change. Noise is ahead of its time. It anticipates social change. What is noise to the old order is harmony to the new. You can just ask any of your parents that. <laughs> you know, like this is a generational thing too, right? That what the older generation hears as noise will eventually be heard as harmony to the new generation, whatever that noise. I mean, you know, back in the 1920s, I'm sure parents were complaining about jazz being noise. You know? um, and then the other sort of um, theoretical uh, guide for the noise element of the project is uh, Theodore Adorno. The um, Adorno's a, a sort of a tricky person to get involved with as a theorist. He's a, a notorious uh, snob when it came to writing about popular music. He very famously was dismissive of jazz um, and, uh, you know, had very, even though he was a Marxist, had very sort of high standards about high culture. Um, but that part I'm not so much interested in as the part, you know, that he wrote um, having to do not with popular music, but with, I guess, what, what we would call classical music. Or I think he just called it good music. <laughs> and, uh, and that's that, you know, music is an intrinsically historical social process. It involves creative subjects engaging with um, the historical weight of the music that has come before them. So it's always a sort of a process of a creative subject working with an uh, objective materials that you know they inherited, uh, and that they sort of try in some way to push forward. And um, within this, he says, you know, music expresses like a conflict between and potential resolution of subject object, part whole structure agency, I individual society. So for noise, the idea is that is that um, noise is this kind of signals uh, a breakdown, or noise signals a kind of a disconnection between these things, between individual society, between part and whole. Uh, that noise is kind of the sound of a fragmented world, uh, a fragmented society, you know, a, a disconnected society, and for Adorno. Um, when he, he has a famous quote that he says, you know, there's no poetry after Auschwitz, meaning that like in, uh, in, in, in a bad world, in a disconnected world, in a fragmented world, um, in an alienated world, the only sort of socially responsible reaction is to make noise that expresses this fragmentation, this lack within society. Um, for him, expressions of harmonic identity, you know, would have been inherently false. Like he probably would have heard, you know, in, if if he had paid attention in the 1960s to like the mamas and the papas or something, you know, that kind of harmonic, um, you know, uh, everybody get together, love one another right now, for him would have been inherently false uh, in this kind of a society. Uh, he is much more of a partisan of atonality in modern music, uh, particularly the music of Arnold Schoenberg. And for him, he believed that this expressed the subject's alienation within 
uh, totalitarian, technocratic forms of capitalist society. So I'm not really so much interested in, in Schoenberg's music per se. I'm more interested in the model of like what Adorno has to say about how music can be a kind of a protest or, or an, a form of noise regardless of you know whether the lyrics are decipherable or even in English or whatever. It's, <laughs> it's not the, the content of the lyrics here so much as the content of the sound and what it expresses. And so in this social context, he believed that revolutionary art um, can only be negative. That is, to express what is absent, to express what is unfulfilled, to express the alienation of the subject from object, to express the alienation of the individual within their society. And if we think about so much of like rock and punk and um, the more socially rebellious forms of music that have come about in you know the past you know, let's say 50 years or so, uh, so much of it does do exactly this. It expresses um, uh, in a negative way what is missing, what is lacking, the uh, fragmentation of the subject from object. Um, I just put this up like as a reminder here that like um, I'm not trying to uh, well rhythm and noise may be sort of um, opposing concepts but not irreconcilable uh, either on a sociological or a musical sort of plane. On a sociological plane, of course, what we want you know is like hopefully to you know resolve this or find a resolution for conflicts between individual and society and such. Um, on a musical plane, there are you know, a number of musical acts that have fused sonically um, these attitudes towards rhythm and noise. And I just put like four albums up here that I think represent that on the, the top two, the Gang of Fours Entertainment and uh, The Clash's London Calling. Both of them integrate sort of punk with uh, Caribbean, and uh, you know, in the case of the Clash, like a lot of reggae and ska. In the case of the Gang of Four, like more uh, of a funk kind of sound. Both of them um, highly politicized lyrics. Uh, both of them expressing this kind of negative absence or the the fragmentation of the subject within the object. Um, like the Clash song, "Lost in the I'm Lost in the Supermarket." I cannot shop happily. <laughs> You know, it's like kind of the um, the subject is sort of overwhelmed in a bewildering uh, postmodern world. And then the two bottom albums, of course, would be more of like a synthesis of like uh, noise and rhythm in the sense of a synthesis of like hip hop and heavy metal or hip hop and punk. Um, the Public Enemies takes a nation of millions to hold us back. You know, it, uh, obviously is a key rap album, but one that incorporates a lot of, I mean, they, they actually called it Noise, the um, the bomb squad, the, the, or the um, how would you describe, the production team, uh, said that they wanted basically to just create a whole bunch of samples that were nothing but organized noise. Um, and so as far as a rap album goes, it has a lot of that kind of influence into it. It's produced by Rick Rubin, who um, did many a sort of rock, hip-hop crossover. And uh, Rage Against the Machine, same thing, you know, sort of like coming from a more metal and uh, punk perspective and then incorporating like hip-hop uh, li lyrics and such. So with those being like this kind of theoretical concept or the theoretical approach, um, I then and planning to use this um, approach to looking at three periods of musical and urban history. And they're not um, meant to be equal in their, obviously in their distribution. One of them, the uh, music of urban migration and cultural conflict that kind of have dated from about the end of World War I to the end of the 50s, the middle part of music of urban crisis and social change, um, of course, you know, mostly covers what we call the 60s. And then the third period of music of deindustrialization and gentrification 
goes from 1970s into the present. How am I doing on time? I just want to make sure I give. Yeah, I'm pretty good. Okay. So I don't have time to. I don't think I'll have time to go through all the historical material. What I'll do is, um, or at least I don't have time to explain them fully. I'll kind of give you, a, you know, a, a taste or a tease of what all of these um, th these three historical periods will feature, as far as um, the place and the kind of music and the connection between them. So, like the earliest, you know, as I was saying about Congo Square, um, any project that would look at American music and uh, rhythm would most certainly have to go to New Orleans and to look at the origins of jazz. As I said earlier, the um, New Orleans is a city where African and, and also Afro-Caribbean forms of music have survived in the United States and in North America in ways that they were not able to survive in you know, the British colonies and such. And of course, a very racially <laughs> conflicted place, uh, New Orleans, um, especially during the time of the birth of jazz is the time when um, the South is trying to in, um, institute Jim Crow segregation. And so um, a lot of the cultural eclecticism of New Orleans, the fact that it's such a diverse place with so many diverse cultures gets kind of uh, polarized into black and white. And the birth of jazz is actually pretty connected with that because you have a lot of like Creole musicians, for example, who are suddenly overnight reclassified as black people in New Orleans. And so it unintentionally creates this kind of cultural dialogue between the Creole musicians and the black musicians in New Orleans. And a lot of jazz comes out of that. Uh, Chicago and Kansas City I look at as um, cities that are were crucial for what we call the Great Migration of African Americans, the migration um, from the rural South into the cities that really takes place um, in two major waves. And the, the first wave is around World War One, uh, and the, the attraction, of course, is the the jobs in the industrial cities. Um, but the effect for music of this is that, of course, like so many of the musicians also go from the rural south into these uh, Midwestern industrial cities. Um, they, their audience, you know, sort of comes with them. And with that, you know, you get a kind of a transformation in the music from um, the, you know, blues, of course, had like a country. Uh, its origins were in the, the rural countryside in the south. But as it moves into the cities, you know, the sound becomes different faster, the rhythms become more intense. Um, it just literally, things accelerate, just like they do in the cities. Uh, and then we go from there to looking at Harlem from the Renaissance to the Great Depression, uh, from jazz in the 20s and swing in the 30s to the creation of the uh, bebop scene in um, Midtown Manhattan during World War II. And then moving on to Memphis and Nashville, again, these uh, key themes are urban migration, racial segregation, the uh, urbanization, commercialization of country music, con you know, blues, country, rock and roll, all sorts of things. And then in the second period, we look at um, the sort of breakdown and crisis in cities. And at the same time, of course, it's one of the most fertile periods in American music uh, ever. And I, I don't think that there's a dis, uh, I, don't think, I don't think that that's a coincidence. Basically, when I look the, at music, you look at things historically, the more you look at, when you look at great music, you usually find some kind of social conflict surrounding it. You know, and that's a kind of a recurring theme here is um, great music always seems to be surrounded by intense social conflict. And I think that a lot of the, the, actually the power of the music is energized by that social conflict. Um, so in New York in the 1960s, you know, I, I sort of begin by looking at um, the crisis in New York City, the urban crisis in New York City, in terms of the famous battle between Jane Jacobs, the urban 
theorist and uh, conserv urban conservationist, I guess we could call her, and Robert Moses, the uh, autocratic New York uh, modernizer who basically never saw a piece of New York. He didn't want to build a bridge over. Um, you know, somebody that was constantly always trying to um, basically destroying and recreating New York all through the beginning of the 20th century or the middle up to the middle part of the 20th century and in the early 60s is when J Jane Jacobs begins to lead a kind of a revolt against that kind of thinking to try to and and does successfully preserve Greenwich Village um, from you know Moses as uh, um, bulldozers now the, at the same time there's a parallel thing that's going on in New York in the early 60s which is a revival of uh, folk music right so there's in each of these things although they're not necessarily connected there's a kind of a, a preservationist impulse an idea of like going to the past to preserve these old traditions rather than you know and it's the first sort of sign of an alternative to the runaway modernization the, that uh, Moses and these people represented um, in the rest of the you know 1960s we have of course like the development of a um, intense free jazz scene in New York and music becomes very uh, especially in the later 1960s becomes very closely connected with um, the um, an emerging postmodern culture emerging postmodern art in New York uh, in the 1960s particularly with the connection between uh, Andy Warhol and and his factory and the group the Velvet Underground the Velvet Underground later becomes um, a band that is very often cited as being perhaps the first punk band or the seminal punk band. All this taking place in counterculture in the East Village. And I put the East Village in quotes here because with um, at this time there's a sort of a re-identification of that part of New York City that had been for so long known as the Lower East Side the home of so many immigrants, um, working people, and such, when the counterculture starts to kind of settle in there and, and colonize that part of New York, it gradually becomes redefined as the East Village. And then in the 80s, real estate uh, interests have a big, uh, have a vested interest in redefining this place as the East Village uh, and, you know, and, and uh, shedding the old identity of the Lower East Side. Detroit is probably where in, you see the, in the most intense breakdown of the uh, classical American Fordist city. I mean, uh, one that had been built on the automobile industry and, um, you know, this sort of the 1950s, 1960s model of urbanization. Uh, and it all starts to really collapse by the end of the 1960s. Um, in the early 60s, though, you have the you know, the heyday of not only the automobile industry, but of Motown also in Detroit. And they're built on basically the same principle of standardized assembly line hit making. You know, that there's a formula for making a good song in the same way that there's a formula for making a good car. The riot of 1967 really kind of triggers the, I guess it's in many ways the culmination of the decline of the city. But, um, you know, Detroit never really recovers. <laughs> uh, it's not, I don't know if you've been there lately, but it's not in good shape now. Um, and, but with this kind of breakdown of uh, the social fabric, you also have the rise in Detroit of a counterculture with uh, John Sinclair, um, the, M the bands, the MC5, and uh, Iggy Pop and the Stooges, also like the Velvet Underground, they will be seen as forerunners of punk. So like the, the earliest sort of punk um, music comes out of this social context where the cities are falling apart in decline and uh, in a state of riot and rebellion. After the riot, uh, black music in Detroit also changes considerably, becomes much more bass heavy, more rhythm heavy, more um, based on like funk and soul become the operative genres um, going beyond the Motown hit parade. So you get artists like uh, you know Stevie Wonder and Marvin Gaye um, beginning to explore 
like social protest in their music in a way that would not have been possible that Barry Gordy and Motown wouldn't have allowed in the early 60s, you know, by the early 70s, you know, Marvin Gaye's doing, um, you know, um, what's going on and stuff. So, you know, there's a sort of a protest move within the music in response to these events. And then uh, probably the, where it all comes together, Los Angeles and San Francisco for in the 1960s, 1950s and 60s, of course, California had been, um, you know, kind of the symbolic promised land of American modernity at its height, you know, when American uh, economic and political power is at its apex and California is uh, seen at least symbolically um, as, uh, I guess you could say, the fulfillment of that modernity. Hollywood and the pop music and the industry like begin to become the new center of the music industry during the 50s and 60s. Uh, up north, the, San, the counterculture in San Francisco uh, sort of evolves from the beat scene uh, in the North Beach area of San Francisco, which you know had been the people that had uh, followed you know Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac and those sorts of folks to becoming a larger, more full-fledged hippie subculture in the Haight-Ashbury during the later 1960s. So much of that is fueled by LSD, which of course is legal in uh, California until 1966. Um, by the time it's made illegal, the cat is out of the bag, you know, like the, there's a psychedelic <laughs> rock scene that has developed in San Francisco and people have become uh, enlightened, I suppose. Um, and an analogous scene take, begins to germinate in Los Angeles, a folk rock scene. The San Francisco and Los Angeles um, embody kind of a opposition, you know, where because LA is more proximate to the uh, music industry, it means that the sounds and things usually tend to be like of a more mainstream kind of variety, more commercially acceptable. So like the, the birds and uh, mamas and papas and, you know, those sorts of bands come out of the 1960s, whereas in San Francisco, there's more of a kind of an anti-commercial ethos and so, you know, Grateful Dead and uh, Jefferson Airplane and um, Big Brother and the Holding Company and Janis Joplin, all those bands sort of emerge from there. And you get the beginnings of um, like this rivalry that you still see between Southern California and Northern California today. If you're from California like I am, you, you're very aware of it, right? This is like no, no, LA is always just kind of seen as more superficial, materialistic, you know, glossy and such, and San Francisco prides itself on being uh, more authentic, more, uh, you know, kind of salt of the earth, more um, grungier, I guess, would have been the term in the 90s. The uh, death of the 60s, symbolically, um, can also, has, um, ha has uh, corresponding events in Southern California and Northern California. In Los Angeles, of course, is the Manson murders in 1969, in the, the, that, uh, that, that summer. And then uh, the Altamont concert in Northern California in 1969, uh, I think it was December of 1969. Altamont was the concert that the Rolling Stones had wanted to do a free show in Northern California, kind of a, a Woodstock on the West Coast. Uh, they made the mistake of hiring the Hells Angels to be their security. They made the second mistake of hire, of uh, paying uh, the Hells Angels in beer, uh, which they proceeded to drink and then uh, basically beat the living hell out of uh, all the hippies that had come to the show. Uh, they had pool cues that were beating them over the head and eventually somebody gets stabbed and, and killed in front of the s uh, stage while the Rolling Stones are playing. Both of these events, like sort of symbolically, um, put the nails in the coffin of the 60s dream. You know, these are the two events that um, uh, are so often are looked back upon as the events that um, are kind of like the end of the innocence sort of events.
it. I'm wrapping it up. Um, and then for this final period of deindustrialization and gentrification, what we're kind of looking at here is the way that like music comes out of um, basically a dual process that's coming in the cities. Uh, on the one hand, you have like deindustrialization, meaning like the outsourcing of all the industrial jobs, the decline of manufacturing, and with that, a crisis that especially affects like the inner city populations um, because of the you know lack of jobs, and and then also the decimation, the uh, the decline of the welfare state, and decline of um, all the social support, uh, and the sort of the other side of that same process is the gentrification of cities in which uh, culture and particularly um, even like artistic culture, m rebellion, music, all these things become uh, ways of like f cities reestablishing themselves or re-identifying themselves, I guess, and luring in like middle class white young people back into the cities. So in New York in the 1970s is a very, uh, in the 70s and 80s is a very uh, crucial transitional moment where you have both the rise of hip hop um, culture in the South Bronx as the South Bronx is literally on fire. You know, the uh, landlords are setting buildings on fire because they're no longer profitable and they want to sh collect the insurance. And so this, you know, South Bronx is literally a war zone when hip hop sort of emerges out of it initially. And uh, going on uh, in Manhattan, you have the rise of punk. And these two movements really, um, even though they don't at first have anything to do with each other, they both come out of this period of social crisis in the city. Um, what will happen in Lower East Side eventually will be this process of gentrification where uh, as I said before, it is redefined as you know no longer the Lower East Side and becomes this the East Village or Alphabet City. And as part of that gentrification, art and noise and rebellion, all these things figured as kind of commodities of ways of like almost like selling the place um, to uh, a new generation of students, who, or not just students, but of young people that would repopulate that area in the 70s and 80s. Um, so you have all these sorts of uh, developments, a very fertile period for music again um, during this time of crisis and conflict in New York. They kind of begin to come together in the 1980s where you get the um, crossovers between punk and hip hop and, um, uh, and uh, rap music continues to be a sort of a form of social protest during these times. Um, within California in the 1980s, you have basically like you have a, a punk, a metal, and a uh, hip hop scene, all of which um, take on elements of crisis. Uh, in Southern California, there's the punk scene moves from being a kind of an urban bohemian scene to being more of a suburban kind of thing. So hence the move from Hollywood to Orange County, from San Francisco to Berkeley, with that uh, spatial relocation comes a kind of a, a, a different style of punk that um, you know, has more affinities with what we call hardcore. Uh, the metal uh, scene, you get to sort of <laughs> an opposition between what's going on in Hollywood with lots of um, young men aspiring to be heavy metal uh, stars, dressing up like, not unlike the strippers and uh, uh, who work in, in Hollywood, <laughs> you know, they're wearing the same sort of clothing and uh, same sexual objecti uh, objectification. Uh, and then in Northern California, you have more of a kind of an East um, the thrash scene. Again, this kind of dialectic, this rivalry between Southern and Northern California about authenticity. Um, and then the uh, hip hop scene. I just want to go through so that I have time for questions here. I kind of whimsically titled this period uh, Indie Town and Ghetto City to talk about things you know, that happened in the 1990s beyond LA and California, 
the same sort of processes, the commercialization of youth cultures, making uh, music and difference and resistance into something that can be sold, um, and it's especially in the 1990s when alternative becomes the new mainstream, um, particularly with the rise of like Nirvana and, and grunge music, um, alternative culture becomes mainstream culture. And then my idea is to kind of end the uh, study with looking at Brooklyn and the role, uh, again, like the transformation and gentrification of Brooklyn and um, the role that music has played in it, both like music, like rap music as being something that, um, you know, with like Jay-Z and, and uh, no Notorious B.I.G. and people like that, that I guess were symptomatic of Brooklyn's decline um, and then this sort of indie rock scene that has emerged in Williamsburg and elsewhere in Brooklyn um, that has been a key part of like the re, I guess I, I would call it the rebranding of Brooklyn um, into uh, the new mecca of hip. <laughs> you know, of, uh, it's transformed from being the mecca of the old ethnic working class to becoming the mecca of hip. And in that sense, it um, parallels the transformation of the Lower East Side in the East Village. Um, I've basically kind of like put in some theoretical conclusions and such here, and, and we could kind of go over them if you want me to elaborate on them at any point, but I w wanted to make sure to leave time for questions and interaction and such. So um, I think I'll stop it there, and we'll start taking questions. Is that good? Okay, thanks. Oh, I get a mic. All right. Um, so the majority of this audience is was born after 1990. Uh, so I wondered if you could explain uh, for our young audience here the role of Vietnam as a powerful moving force in all that counterculture and Noise. movement for change in the 60s yeah. and 70s. Um, I can't do it quickly. <laughs> uh, the Vietnam War, um, I mean, it's as close as the United States got to fighting a second civil war as far as it's the way that it divided the nation, um, not simply over the war, but the, it um, is a catalyst for a whole cultural chasm that opens up between the generations, not just over the war, but about how long someone's hair is about the kind of music that they listen to, what the older generations would have, you know, dismissed as noise. Um, it, I mean, the Vietnam War has a massive impact on American youth and youth culture, I'd say beginning in about 1965, 1966, as a dramatic transformation. I mean, as a shorthand, you can look at, you can look at pictures of the Beatles compare what they look like in 1963 with what they look like in 1969. It gives you a good indication of like the accelerated rate of cultural change in America and in the world at that time. You know, um, just things moving and changing so fast. Um, and the sense that the war um, kind of eliminated any kind of moral consensus that had been in place in the previous decades, you know, whereas in the 50s and 60s, or most of the 60s, you, people didn't really question or took their major institutions of the society for granted, you know. Um, by the late 1960s, spurred on by Vietnam, and also, you know, s the civil rights movement and the racial conflicts in the United States as well. Um, because of that, it's it's like everything is up for grabs. You know, nobody, no, there's no um, kind of consensus culturally left in the in the country. And and again, I think that's why you get some of the best music is because uh, music, I think, is fueled by these conflicts and inequalities, energized by them. Yeah. Students. Do students have a question? Okay, um, going off of the idea, I took some notes actually, okay. that um, music expresses the lack in society. So in um, 
retro punks and pinup girls. Mm -hmm. You spoke about um, the spectrum from nostalgia to sort of the more lighthearted um, right. camp. Yeah. yeah. So where do you think, or um, does the good music, where does it fit on that spectrum? Mm -hmm. um, what does the good music of today, like what do they say about the lack of society? is for today. I'm sorry, I'm not wording this very well. That's okay. I, I, um, I'll catch people up to speed. I, I guess you were one of the students that read a part of my early, my first book, which is, I, um, there's a chapter in there that's about, it's called Retro Punks and Pinup Girls, and it's about like the, the I guess you could say like the retro turn in youth culture, I guess beginning in about, I dated around the 70s and 80s, at least the beginning of it where youth cultures, you know, in the 60s had been all, you know, modern and looking towards the future, and, you know, literally the mods. Um, beginning, I'd say, 70s, 80s, 90s, youth culture increasingly looks, begins to look backwards. You know, they begin to, uh, you know, recycle vintage clothing. They begin to, um, and in music, I would say that the predominant way that that takes place is through sampling. I'd say like hip hop sampling um, is a way of like re-encoding the past into the present, like, you know, sort of a retro recycling of that. And it can take on, just as the retro culture can take on any kind of, you know, something from like a more serious kind of nostalgia to a more kind of tongue in cheek camp, um, music can do, the, has the same kind of range of emotional responses to the past. I, th I think that answers part of your question. Yeah. yeah. Um, the second part was, what is the lack in society that good music is expressing today? Oh, well, um, God, I think my answer is Jay-Z. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's like, uh, I mean, I think so much of hip hop, like, is energized by that, um, the just deep and persistent social inequalities, especially in the inner cities of America. You know, I think like that's where um, so much of our uh, the, the 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 freshest uh, forms of cultural innovation are coming from is coming from you know the most impoverished, oppressed, and uh, you know beaten segment of our society. So, I think that kind of answers. Yeah. 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 Thank yeah. you. Hi, thanks Hi. so much. It was super interesting. Um, so as I was listening to your presentation, you know, I, you think of, um, and I think of this too, you know, music as being this fantastic vehicle for social change, giving voice to the, the oppressed and to, you know, groups to have noise in a way that, um, that can be effective kind of in the long run. And it kind of breaking down barriers. You know, I think of Rage Against the Machine as being this super group that, you know, brings kind of Asian influences of hip hop and yeah. kind of this London band, super, you know, great, really interesting. And then I think about um, kind of music skinheads, for example, and the way in which kind of music, kind of white skinhead music in the 70s was used as a vehicle, uh, you know, a vehicle to bring together youth who are feeling alienated, you know, working class white youth yeah. from Britain as a vehicle for social change, but, <laughs> but in a very, <laughs> very problematic way. Yeah. Um, so, that, you know, kind of changing skinhead roots, which had been very different, kind of multicultural, mm -hmm. and then using that to kind of co-opt a group of disenfranchised young people and then using mu music as kind of a vehicle to kind of glue them together. And so I'm curious about whether that kind of makes it into your research or? Yeah, um, it's something I, I did, I addressed that more in like the first book where I talked about um, in that very thing in the 1970s where you have a conflict between um, like the racist white skinheads, like you see in, predominantly in England, but also in the United States, there's a lot of, um, uh, with the hardcore punk scene, you have the sort of like the kids whose disaffection and alienation from society is then channeled into, you know, these hateful forms of like racism. And then, but you also have like the alternative that you have like anti-racist skinheads that also come about, you know, like that, um, they get into ska music and uh, they call it, you know, like the two-tone music, the black and white together. And there's a movement in England uh, called Rock Against Racism that comes about in 1976, 77, 78. That's um, predominantly trying to recruit like those young, disaffected, 
alienated kids away from the you know neo-fascist message or the racist message of the National Front in England at that time. Um, so, you know, it, like noise, I guess the answer is like noise doesn't have any in inherent or intrinsic politics, you know, just because it's disaffected and rebellious doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to turn in a progressive direction. That like social movements are in the business of trying to um, co-opt or absorb that, th that kind of energy and you know, potentially can use it for those kinds of purposes, you know, most certainly. Uh, yeah, what is your opinion on uh, the increase in frequency and I'll even go as far as say as overabundance in uh, uh, sellout musicians? <laughs> sellout musicians? Well, there's always been sellout musicians. Um, Let's see, uh, I mean, f first of all, like, it's, uh, I mean, there's, there's basically, like, different kinds of musicians. Some of them, it's hard to accuse them of selling out when they never really were authentic to begin with. You know, they, they, all they ever wanted to do was be part of the pop music industry, so it's, like, hard to accuse them of being sellouts. Um, and then you have, but you do have, I guess the people that I would call sellouts are the, the ones that we have, um, people where music is first and foremost supposed to be an artistic, creative expression for them, you know, something that's supposed to come from their soul or what have you. And uh, increasingly they, um, you know, I guess commercialize that or commodify that. In some ways it's like, um, I, I think I, I might be seeing less of that um, because, um, it's harder to make a living as a musician now in this day and age where, you know, people can pretty much get their music for free and the recording industry is in a, a lot of trouble. Um, their sales are way, way down. They don't invest in uh, musicians except for the star musicians in the ways that they used to. So you have like, a you know, the Beyonce's and stuff on the top, but you know, the middle range, like rock musicians that in the 70s might have been signed to a record deal, oftentimes they, um, they're they on their own. So in some ways, like, I, I feel like that's opened up a good thing in music, that there, there are probably less people playing for music just because maybe there's less music, m less uh, money to be made. There's less people playing for money because there's less money to be made, you know? Um, you know, I, I don't. I don't know if that gives you a satisfactory answer <laughs> to the question. Some feelings and thoughts. Yeah, I mean, you know, like I think it's. I think it's harder to sell out these days. <laughs> um, I think it's. You know, musicians. Um, if you're going to be a musician these days, like you can't. Like um, a record deal or a recording contract isn't going to be the way to do it in a way that it would have been in the 70s and 80s. Like today, if you're musicians and you want to make a living at music, um, the predominant thing you have to do is play live and uh, tour. And I think that's how a lot of musicians make their, at least make a living. And then like, you know, maybe s selling a song to a uh, commercial or something like that if, you know, you can really, um, you know, make make a lot of money. But, I'm, you know, like a few months ago, there was a cover story in New York Magazine about the band Grizzly Bear, who had just played Radio Music Hall, just sold Radio Music Hall out in New York, and the whole article was about how poor they were, <laughs> about how they, none of them had health insurance. And these are, you know, supposedly big rock stars on the cover of New York Magazine, you know. Um, and I think a lot of that does have to do with the decline of recording industry. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, yeah. earlier in your talk, you talked about um, a cultural dialogue, mm -hmm. which is like one of the terms that you referenced in your first book. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I was wondering um, if you were going to touch upon the same like area of topics as your first book, or is it like completely different? No, it's... Um I would say like I use the same theoretical framework or the same like way of looking at things. I'm just looking, it's just that what I'm applying 
it too is a more of a historical study. So like for that first book, it was predominantly ethnographic. It was, you know, predominantly contemporary and, and predominantly involved me, you know, going out to clubs and interviewing people and stuff like that. Um, and with this book, I, I would say the more, it's, it's, the difference is less about how I'm looking at it and more that like I'm just looking at taking a more historical perspective um, and not, you know, hanging out in clubs and interviewing people <laughs> anymore. My ears, my ears can't take it. <laughs> I spent a lot of time as a graduate student in, uh, in, in music clubs. Uh, hi, I'm interested in what uh, you would say uh, Adorno, uh, yeah. and more importantly, what you think about the music that came out in the late 60s, early 70s, that, that, that laid down a very cute radical critique of society number of levels, mm -hmm. but that was written harmonically yeah, and was right. pleasing, and also had in it uh, an underlying text of uh, possibility of solidarity, community, you know, songs like Wooden Ships, um, yeah, It's All Right, right. Mom. So was this stuff just like the dustbin of history? I mean, my memory is Adorno sort of dismisses all this stuff as being playing around. It's not really art. What, what do you say about it as art, as revolutionary art, and its efficacy in history? I mean, those, those, I think a lot of those songs, that the harmonically based songs in the 60s, the, like Wooden Ships and like the really, um, the, a lot of that seems to me to come out of the folk music scene. Um, where again, like music was like a participatory ap activity where everybody sang, you know, together and, uh, you know, d something pe people learned in summer camps and, you know, was, you know, folk music was the basis of solidarity. Um, I think that music, uh, it sounds dated for a reason now because, um, you know, people don't really do that anymore. I think that there's, and I think that there's a sociological reason for that. I think that there's just less harmony in our society. And so harmony sounds kind of um, artificial or kitschy or, you know, retrograde. Um, Nirvana on their, uh, on Nevermind, the, the big Nirvana album, they make fun of that kind of thing. They're, you know, the, the song, Every, come on now, everybody smile on your brother, get together, love one another right now, blah, blah, blah. One of the Nirvana songs called Territorial Pissings, they start off with that, but they sing it in a really sick kind of grotesque way to make it almost like they're, they're like kind of making fun of it and also saying like, you know, what happened to those ideals? Those, you know, it's like, um, but it's so, it seems so out of date in a society that, um, where there just isn't very much harmony to be found. I think. But, but in, in that historical frame, when the in songs that were written performed, was it, was it revolutionary art with any efficacy in your judgment, or was it just to be dismissed as... Uh, oh, no, I think, it, I think it was definitely, like, in that context, I believe it to be... Um, I, I, believed it to, I believe it was, like, significant in term a significant source of social change. I mean, obviously, it didn't end up being revolutionary but um, one that had revolutionary implications. Today, I don't think it would work the same way. Like, I don't think that, um, that a revolutionary music of the present would, would sound like that. I don't think it would be so harmonious. Like, Thank you. Yeah. Well, Brian. Oh yeah. Renaissance and right. Dance. Like, do you do you have any thoughts about that? Because I agree, it, it doesn't sound the same today. No, I think it's completely counter-revolutionary. <laughs> I think Mumford and Sons in particular. <laughs> um, I yeah, I, I guess there there is the, the there is a, some something of a revival of people singing together and such. Um, but you know, unlike in 1960s, it's perfectly mainstream and. You know, I, I, I don't think, uh, I think even like if Mumford and Sons had something revolutionary to say, right, even in the way that they sing and the way that they do things, I think it would still sound, I mean, they could, they could be singing, you know, smash the state and it would still sound harmless given the form in which they're singing it. Mm. 
Okay, I think we are out of time, so thank you. Thank you.